Good morning and welcome everybody to our water treatment virtual day event. Today, you guys are in for a treat. We have our amazing presenter, Miss Betsy Fortman, who's going to be leading the day. I want to remind everybody, we are so excited, but our, our goal here is to get you engaged and excited. So please do not hesitate to type in chat if you have a question or a comment and we will, uh, Oh, see, Betsy's ready to roll. She has her slides up and she wants to say hi to everybody. But I want to say thank you to the ET team who, who put this together. Thank you to all your teachers for being on time and ready to roll. And let's, without further ado, let's pass this off to Ms. Betsy Fortman to lead this amazing water treatment day. Yes, you guys, thank you so much for allowing me in your classroom today. It is such an honor to be here. Um, with you all. And I'll tell you just a little more about my background in a second. As you know, we are here for water treatment. So we're going to be talking about how to make water that is dirty, clean. And that is our goal today. Um, as we are sitting here, I want you to think about, you know, it's not that late, right? It's 10 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time. So like how many times have you guys used water in your day today? I am curious. If you have Slido, you are welcome to go ahead and um, pull your phone out and QR code it if your teacher is okay with that. If not, just put it in your mind and let us know like in a second if this is you. Okay, how many times have you used water? Sometimes we forget how often we use it and it is incredible. So if you guys got up and had something to drink this morning, did you have water or something that had water in it? Um, did you guys brush your teeth, wash your face, wash your hands? Maybe you took a shower already. Um, maybe you worked out and then um, had to drink some water after it. Look at all of these wonderful answers. So some of you said, you know, one to five times I've used it so far and it's only 10 a.m. Um, we take it for granted so often in the United States, all the different ways. So if you are wearing clothes, Someone probably washed your clothes, whether that was you or your parents or someone else, um, all of these different ways. And I want you to think today, what are ways in which you can reduce what we're going to call your water footprint, like how we use water and how we can do it more efficiently. So if you're in the United States, you probably have access to clean water, right? Um, a lot of times we forget how easily it can get contaminated. I don't know if you guys heard about this accident. Have you guys seen this? This is a drone footage. This happened in Ohio, just I think it was last week, Tuesday-ish, um, where there was a railroad uh, train carrying uh, several different cars that had vinyl chloride in it. And um, this is really toxic. Um, firefighters couldn't even go respond because if it gets into the air, um, it can cause um, some respiratory problems. It will also cause certain kinds of cancers and problems with kidneys. So instead of letting this just sit, they decided to actually um, let it go up into the air because it was safer to have it that way than to have it seep into our water. Think about that. Just one railway problem could cause some contamination, right? Um, something that could affect quite a bit of people in just a short amount of time. Um, so whether you live in the United States and have those concerns or you live somewhere else and you don't have the cleanest water, today we're going to talk about, you know, how we can take water and how we can decontaminate it. Um, so here we go today. I'm curious, if you lived in these areas, what do you think you might find in the water? You're welcome to type in the chat, uh, your teachers for you. Um, just let me know what you think is in there. And you don't even have to say it out loud. Just think in there. Do you think there might be some trash? Do you think there might be some bacteria? Maybe some viruses? Yes, exactly. Nelson Mandela, you're right. Mud, trash, bacteria, all of that stuff. And so today we're going to talk about what things contaminate our water and how we can treat it. Um, so real quickly, I just wanted to give you a quick preview. We're not going to go into this yet. But your job today will be to become a water treatment engineer. You will be creating a design to help filter some of that dirty water and make it clean. That is our goal today, okay, you guys? Let's get started learning about the details. But before I do that, I wanted to tell you, who am I? Like, why am I in your class today, right? So as you can see, my name is Betsy Fortman, and I am an aerospace engineer by my design, like by my schooling and all of that. 
Um, how I got there though, I just started out as this curious toddler from the first time I can remember and the smallest pictures of me. I'm out, I don't even know if I can walk at the point, but I'm out with my dad with these tools trying to build our swing set. Um, I used to take things apart all the time. As I grew up, the more and more things I took apart. I took apart our phone and maybe you guys have seen me before because some of your names look familiar. Um, you know that I took apart our rotary phone just to see how the wiring worked. I took apart our computer, but you guys, the very worst thing that I ever took apart was our car door. I think I was about nine years old and my mom had run in somewhere and my sister and I were in the car and all of a sudden I was like, how does this work? So it wasn't like I said, hey, let me take the door apart. I just took, started flipping things and pulling things apart. And before I knew it, I couldn't shut the door. My poor mom had to hold the car door shut and drive us home, you guys. It was not good. However, I now know this is called reverse engineering. Um, you know, studying how things work by taking them apart and hopefully putting them back together, right? Um, anyways, I wanted to use my curiosity not just to break things, but to use it for something bigger than myself. And I chose to go into the space program. I knew at a very early age that I wanted to go in and enter engineering. Um, and I knew I was really interested in space. So some of you guys had sent us some questions and I'll try to answer them along the way. Um, you know, what events led you to pursue this field work? Um, some Ursuline had said this as well as Our Lady of Lords. So again, I just was super curious about how everything worked around me. And, and in about the fourth grade, I remember saying uh, even to my parents that I was going to be an astronaut. Well, I knew I couldn't be an astronaut myself as I got older because I had a broken back and a couple other things. Um, but I always knew that I couldn't be there. I wanted to help other people get there. And that was my goal. Um, so I decided to go to college that had a good program. So I looked for ones that had good engineering schools that had, you know, lots of applications going on. And then number two, which ones had a lot of astronauts? Because I figured if they had a lot of astronauts, then they probably were pretty good in the space areas, right? So I chose Purdue University for my particular um, degree. I went to Purdue and I did something called a co-op program. I am curious. So you can give your teacher thumbs up or down. Um, do you, you guys know about the co-op program and what it is? You might hear like co-op program, co-op student, most of the time, people don't know what this is, and that's totally fine. Um, when you get to colleges, a lot of our colleges around the United States are paired with different companies. And what this means, you guys, is that as an engineering student, you start working an engineering job right away. It's so cool. So raise your hands. Have any of you found yourself in a classroom wondering, why am I learning this? When will I? ever use this. There are calculators and computers. Why do I need to know this? Anyone? Okay, I didn't think I was alone. Okay, so that was me. I remember my professors teaching me all these big long equations that went with how the air flowed over the wings of an aircraft. And I remember thinking, why do I need to calculate this? And why is this important? I know it's supposed to all fit together, but it wasn't right that second. I was like, it's just a lot of math right now. What was super cool is the very next semester, I found myself at Langley Research Center. So that's the NASA Center over in Virginia for all you Virginia and Norfolk people. Um, I was finding myself placing the sensors on the F-18 with the engineering team and watching them as they were preparing to do wind tunnel tests. Um, so it was so cool. And then all of a sudden, there was days when I was sitting there going, when will I use this? Flooded back to me. And I totally could see why we were learning those equations, trying to figure out where to put the sensors and what we were trying to control in the, the wind tunnel itself. So it was so cool. If you ever have a chance to um, do something hands-on in your field, whether that be engineering or whether that be uh, maybe you want to be a vet, I would highly recommend trying to get a position while you're still learning about it 
um, so that you can start figuring out the things you really like, maybe the things that you don't necessarily like, but you still need to know so that you can get to that next part in your career. It's so rewarding. And you know what? It helps you make contacts in the industry as well. Um, so that was one of the questions that some of the students had asked, you know, if you're interested in a particular job, um, you know, how do you go about it? Look at good schools, get any experience possible, even if it's just working at the counters, um, you know, taking taking orders as people are coming in asking for their dog medicine or whatever it might be, okay? Because any experience you're getting, you are already exposed to all the terminology and the foundations that go into that. Um, you can see on the screen when I graduated, I went to NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, I really, really, really wanted the space aspects. I loved working at NASA, but I was mostly working on aircraft at Langley. And so I chose to go down to NASA Johnson Space Center. If you guys have heard, doot, 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 Houston, we have a problem. Um, that is mission control. Um, so that's who the astronauts would be talking to. Um, so it was my job to help here are astronauts and our flight controllers um, for the guidance, navigation, and control system. So that's the system that kind of controls how we are related to the stars, like how our attitude is in space, um, how we perform reboosts and things like that, um, as well as how we do dockings with the International Space Station. Um, in this job, um, I got to work with some amazing instructors and different um, engineers both in our country as well in many other countries. In fact, I found myself in Star City, Russia, learning all the Russian systems with our astronauts and helping prepare them for flight and teaching them those systems as well. Um, so that was kind of me in a nutshell, right out of college. When I came back to the States about six years later, I joined the astronaut office as their chief engineer. Um, where I was helping to kind of lay the groundwork for what we now call Orion and Artemis on the left-hand side. Right, this one's so cool because we just flew this one to the moon, did a distant retrograde orbit, and came back. And in our wrap-up, I will show you some footage of that and how it kind of ties into water treatment. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the commercial crew and SpaceX Boeing um, vehicles that we go back and forth to the space station on. So that is me in a quick nutshell. As many of you know, um, all of our engineering Tomorrow Labs are created by a team of engineers. So on the left, we have Edgar Martinez, who was our lead engineer creating this particular lab for you guys today. And on the right, we have Muna and Caroline as well. These are our summer interns and mentors that will, our college mentors that will help, you know, answer some of your questions um, and things like that. So later today, you'll have a, an opportunity to talk to some other mentors um, and ask some questions about your designs. All right, jumping right in to water and how it's so important for us. So you can see on the screen, we have this big globe, right? Our earth. I am curious, looking at that earth and looking at the water, how much do you think, how much water do you think is available for us, like fresh water and all of that? Anyone know? Go ahead in Slido. If you probably already saw it in Slido, you are welcome to go ahead and put your answers. Look at you. You all are on it already. So our fresh water is only 3% of that. Can you believe that? So looking at that, all of this water here is our ocean water, right? And our ocean water has something in it that will not allow us to drink. Well, first of all, there may be bacteria and other things, right? But that salt water isn't something that we can actively drink right like it is. Um, and so later on in our discussion, we'll talk about how we can use some of that water perhaps um, going forward. 3%, and guess what, all of that 3%, only part of it is unfrozen. You guys, glaciers make up of that 3%, 70% of that is frozen in glaciers. Incredible, right? So we're talking a sliver of a sliver of what water we can actually use for humans. All right, so now we're gonna talk about if you have had a glass of water, coffee, um, you know, there are certain aspects of how much water go into making that. 
I've already given you some conversions up here on our screen. Like how many cups are in a liter of water? Boom. Four. 4.22, okay. Um, and then how many are in a gallon? 16. All right, so I got a question for you. Here's my cup of coffee. How many cups of water do you think it took to make this coffee? You're welcome to have your teacher type it in the chat. How many you think? Do you think it's one cup, five cups? All right, there we go. We got some answers flowing in, maybe two cups, maybe one. You guys are gonna be blown away by this. Are you ready? Here we go, 42 cups. Ursuline, you're getting closer. I love this. All right, 16, okay, here we go. Guess what, you guys? In order to make our morning latte, it will take 801 cups of water. Are you guys? Amazed because I certainly was. So typically we think about, you know, okay, how much water is in this particular mug, right? Um, but there are so many more aspects that the water actually plays a part in, in all the process. Like, for example, the people who are working to kick and get the coffee, how we process the beans, we have to clean the beans and so on and so forth. And there's so many aspects of the water that goes into that, growing the beans. All of that has to be put together in order to find out how much water did go into this one cup. You know, our plants can't grow without water. So amazing. Yeah, Dunbar, you guys were getting closer. I love it. Wonderful job, you guys. All right, so enough about me talking about water. I'm gonna have you watch this video that will give you a little more um, background about our resources on earth and then how we can reduce it. As you watch this, I would love for you and your class to think about ways that we can reduce our water footprint. All right, let's take a look.
Okay. For those of you that were able to watch that, I hope it led you to start thinking about ways that we are using our water um, and how we can use it more efficiently. So that one, that video was just um, a silent video with just a little bit of noise a lot, or music for the noise. Um, so if you didn't hear anything, you should still be all set. Um, so I'm curious, you guys, what did you learn from this? What ways can we reduce our water footprint? Does anyone have any ideas? How can we reduce our water footprint? All right, I see people typing. Yeah, awesome. As you're typing, I'm going to put a little diagram. Um, so we use water for so many things, but you guys, I'm going to challenge you. Do you become engineers in the future? Um, maybe some of you will go down this route. Is there a way that we can maybe take our shower water or our laundry water or just the water that comes from washing our hands? If we flip a valve and say, move this water into a different tank, and put that tank to apply our toilet. Just that one step alone would reduce our water footprint. Showering less time. Oh, that's such another good, good example. Other people have said, maybe go ahead and buy clothes um, from thrift stores so that we're not creating more goods that have also this um, need for water as well. Super, super answers, you guys. I love it. Um, maybe lessening how much water you're using or if you can collect the water from your shower as you turn it on and wait a minute while it heats up, all that water. Awesome. You guys have so many comments coming in on both the Slido and the chat. I absolutely love it. So good. Um, by lessening our use of water, we can try to do small things, which will end up being big things. So, so true. Way to go. All right, so let's talk how you guys are going to do it today. Your job, do, 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 if you choose to accept it, will be to design a filter that will help take some of that dirty water and make it cleaner. And um, so we have just learned about the scarcity of water and the fact that, you know, our water system is a closed system. So it's not like we're getting new water um, from other places. And we need to really keep that in mind. And then how can we reuse our water? in better, more efficient ways and treat the water that we do have. Uh, super. So here's your challenge. We've already showed you a preview of your picture. I wanted to lay out a roadmap for you guys. This actually comes a little bit later normally in our slides, but just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, imagine that dirty water. So imagine either you are going out to a lake and you have to clean some water or you're in a third world country and you're trying to get some water so that we can use it. Here are kind of the basic steps along the process of taking that dirty water and then putting it together like with some chemicals. We will use something called flocculation. These chemicals will help all of those gross particles kind of slip together or coagulate. Um, and then they can settle to the bottom and we can get those out of the way and out of our water. Um, next would be what we would call micro fil filtration or ultra filtration. So using particular solids in order to take out some of the bacteria and other things that are in our waters, um, using reverse osmosis. Um, so having some kind of barrier. I kind of think of it like this barrier here. Um, the dissolved solids won't move through holes, depending on how big those holes are. Um, this is obviously a huge scale, but if you can imagine a reverse osmosis having a wall of really tiny holes um, that only the cleaner water can get through and leaving some behind some of those dissolved solids. Um, lastly, we would then, after we do all that stuff of cleaning it and filtering it and then keeping back any solids, we would do our very last step, which would be disinfecting. Now, this could be either done chemically, like with chloride or chlorine, sorry, um, or using ultraviolet. So I don't know if you guys have heard since like the COVID and all of that effects that ultraviolet is being used to kill certain viruses and other bacteria, making it so that whatever is in the water isn't going to make you sick. And then lastly, we hit the clean water. So that's quickly the roadmap of what we'll be looking at. Today, you guys are going to build a multimedia filtration unit. 
So this is kind of where you fit in. Now, once you get through this lab, if you really like um, working on this, there's actually an extension that will also allow you to make a clarifier, um, which we'll talk about in the extension area, and then that will feed into your multimedia. But the red ones is the base of our lab today. All right, so you might be thinking, what contaminates our water, right? Well, there's three major things. So suspended solids. So you can imagine like mud or leaves or anything like that would be our suspended solids. Usually you can use a screen or a filter to kind of get those out. I think of it like a skimmer almost from the, getting it off of the top of a swimming pool, like getting all those things out. Um, next would be those dissolved solids. And we talked a little bit about that reverse osmosis, um, you know, keeping those back from the one side of the filter because they can't physically go through that barrier membrane. And then lastly, those microorganisms that we could use that UV radiation to help and also chlorination, right? Um, so those are the things that contaminate water and a little bit about how we take care of them. How do we know how dirty our water is, right? So we can see that looks kind of dirty, right? Would you guys want to drink that right now? Well, probably not. We probably wouldn't want to drink that right away. Um, but how do we measure it? We measure it by this word we call turbidity. So typically, we want clean water. So we want it down here in this very low end. On the high end, our, you know, you can imagine it's pretty dirty water. So here's our turbidity. Um, you can see the World Health Organization states that we should be at least five or lower if we're drinking it. Um, in the corner, when we start our lab today, you're going to make some really gross water, okay? You'll have in your kit some cinnamon and some pepper. The cinnamon is meant to stain the water and give it that brown murky color. Um, and then the pepper is meant to simulate some of those um, pucker pieces that we would like coagulate out, okay? So when you make your dirty water, you will measure your turbidity based on the scale in your workbook. It looks just like this. Um, and then you'll be able to test, like, you know, how good is it? How bad is it? And then can I make it better? That's the best question you get to ask today. Can I make it better? But I love it. Um, there's another way that we can also test our turbidity or like how many things are in our water. If you guys have ever heard of the zero water filters, um, this is basically what we're going to be doing today. Um, this water filter um, will have multimedia just like you're going to use. And then it also has a little sensor that comes with it. I love this because you can put it in your different waters and see how many parts per million uh, are in there. It's so cool. And not only that, but I was able to test our water and I have a reverse osmosis system. So I use the tap reverse osmosis and then I went and put it through the zero water. And I could not believe it, you guys. When I did this, look at this. I have them set out here for you. They are all basically the same clearness, right? Can you see that? Let me back up. Tap reverse osmosis and the zero water filter. This one came out at 127 parts per million, right from my tap. This one, after reverse osmosis, was 38 parts per million. And this one, you guys, zero. What? Isn't that amazing? Um, so if you're curious about your water, there, one of the questions that you all sent in to us was, you know, how safe is your drinking water? Uh, I believe Sanjay will talk more about it, but if you're curious, um, Home Depot and other places have kits that you can actually, they give away for free. They usually walk down the aisles asking you if you want one. Um, and then you can take these kits home, make a sample of your tap water and send it in and they will give you uh, a report back about everything that's in your water. Um, you could be using reverse osmosis to take out some of those dissolved solids like you saw. It reduced mine by about a hundred parts per million, amazing. Um, or you could also do that added um, filter, if you will. Zero filter, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It looks a lot like Brita and that big white container is that multimedia filter that you're gonna create today. So let's get started. How are we going to make it clean? So we're going to use this multi-step process in order to clean our waters. Take a look at this one. Let me make sure I have it up on the sound for you too. 
Give me a thumbs up if you hear it okay. Awesome. Okay, so that kind of gave you a visualization of that roadmap I was talking about. And what we're going to jump in today is that water filtration or the removing and reducing of those particles um, in order to make our water cleaner. Um, as you can imagine, we as engineers are always in our minds thinking, how can I make something better? How can I help the people around me? So if you are thinking about maybe um, trying to make the water for your family cleaner or the water for third world countries cleaner, depending on what scale you're thinking of, um, you're going to design a system. You will build, then test it. See, did my water get better? And that's what we're going to do today. Test it. Try it out. And then we're going to learn from it and see if we can make second design. I'm hoping that you guys get at least two different runs in today with different layering of your multimedia layer. Um, I've used this term several times already, multimedia. I'm curious, when you hear this, what comes to your mind? For me, it's so funny. I think of like Facebook and uh, Netflix and other ways that we can get media, right? I don't know if that's you as well, maybe it is. Um, when I hear the term multimedia, the first thing I would say is let's break it apart. Multi meaning multiple. And then media, something that it's coming through. Like, is it coming through Netflix or Facebook or whatever? Guess what? The same is going to be true of breaking ours apart. Today, we're going to be looking at multiple media that will catch our contaminants. Okay, so here we go. In your filter, you will be creating on the right-hand side, you can kind of see here, we've sent you different materials in order to do this. So pebbles and sand and some bigger rocks, um, things like that, that you can use, as well as coffee filters, cotton balls, and guess what? Anything you have in your classroom, you are welcome to try as long as your teacher is okay with it, um, whether that be paper towels or um, pieces of actual paper. So. Think about what you're trying to clean out. Now, again, I showed you that brown water, that's going to have pepper as well as cinnamon in it. And so as you're making that part and making the dirty water, think about what multimedia layer is going to clean out the problem that I have in that water, okay? What will trap that material the best? Is it going to be sand that will trap it the best? Or maybe it's the coffee filter that will trap it the best. Um, so again, here is a picture of some really dirty water. We're simulating that with our brown water. Um, but you can see here, another question that you all sent in that I loved was, can we use this technology for other countries that don't have fresh water or clean water? 
Yes, absolutely. In fact, you can see here, there is something called a life straw. That, look at this. Those little pieces are pebbles, just like our multimedia layers that we're going to be making today um, that are inside this basically straw. So you can see here, this uh, woman is putting it into like a stream or some kind of water source. Um, as she is sucking the water up through the straw, it is going through that filter to clean out any big particles um, and to help clean it. And then she gets her water through the straw. Um, here are a couple other pictures of the life straw in case you're wondering what it looks like, how big it is. Um, so those are out there on the market, as well as you can see these cool ones, these ceramic water filters. I love showing this because you guys will be taking your, um, your water bottles, you will be cutting them apart and actually making the tank that will store your water. Um, so as you can see, the contaminated water will end up at the bottom and then the good water will be filtered out. All right, so let's take another look. So I wanted to just point out real quickly this particular tank, right? So we have these ceramic water filters and guess what they look a lot like? They look a lot like what we have on the International Space Station, you guys. Um, so you may not think about it because we've talked a lot about Earth and Earth's resources, but we have the same concerns in space. You know, we can't get new water very easily without having to send up a progress resupply ship or something to that effect. Um, so we have to be very careful with the water that we're using. And I want to say it's somewhere around 90% of our water um, gets reused on orbit. These tanks over here are what we call the Yedeve tanks, um, and they will store water. Um, these are the Russian tanks you can see here. Um, and then in the upper left-hand corner um, are some CWC bags or contingency water um, bags there. So I wanted to show those because it's so similar to what we're talking about, how we can keep our water clean and safe. On orbit, we have to worry about those same contaminants. You know, if you're in a spacecraft, you know, which is basically like pop can, right? So you're in this area and you, there's no getting in or out. Um, if you have humidity and you can have fungus start growing or bacteria, and we definitely don't want that in our water supply on orbit. So we have to be very careful about, you know, keeping our water on orbit clean and safe as well. Um, for your lab today, again, you should have your materials. Um, you will be cutting apart a bottle of like plastic um, where you will then invert the top and notice it kind of goes down inside. I am going to show you a couple things that I did. But once you have your filter kind of inverted there, you will use that top part to start layering. And I want you to think, what layers are going to be the best for me? Should I use gravel, sand, gravel, sand? coffee filter? Um, should I use coffee filter gravel, coffee filter gravel? However you want to do it, you're the engineer today. You get to decide. That's the coolest part of engineering is you get to design it. And as we go through this, you'll test it, see how you're doing, and then try it again um, with a different solution. Now, I'm going to give you just a few tips, okay? Here are our tips. When I cut mine, I like to tape my upper part because I was afraid it would slide around as I was pouring my water into the top. You can see I've layered it here. This is my brown water, that very turbid water. Um, and you will be going through and just testing your system. Now, one other tip, you may want to pre-saturate, which means go ahead and run clean water through your filter first. And that way, um, all of the different, um, you know, cotton balls and all those things are ready to go and ready to help get the contaminants out as well. So use some of those hints if they are helpful. There is a video in your workbook um, that will show you kind of how it can be done. This is just one example. Of course, um, feel free to uh, change. Feel free to change the order that you're putting them in. Um, for sure, you are welcome to do anyway. Just remember, write it down in your workbook because that's the most important part of engineering, knowing what you've changed and how it can be better. And, you know, from one version to the other, make sure that you're recording it so that you know what else you can change to make it better. Um, so you can see on the screen is our quick filter video demo.
And yes, yeah, someone is asking us to share that particular video. It is linked inside your workbook, so you will have that for sure. Um, but we can share that as well for you. No worries. And you can kind of see here, she was layering in there um, the different multimedia layers that she had chosen. And now, here are a couple tips for you. It will take a little bit of time. I want to challenge your school, specifically your class. How much water can you get out of your filter in 60 seconds? Right, so that's one challenge. My second challenge to you is whose water is the cleanest as it comes out? So those are two good questions. Again, list your materials in the order that they are. Um, a really smart man called Stephen Covey, I believe, um, had said to begin with the end in mind. And so for you guys today, because you are the engineers, you will then create your cost. Like we want these filters to be able to help everyone, right? Not just the millionaires and billionaires. So we need to know like how expensive is it going to be to make it? Um, in your kit, you'll have the different um, list of how much everything will cost. And so calculate how much did your filter cost? And see, um, you know, using your coffee filters are probably the most expensive because they're going to clean it pretty well. So you'll notice um, some of the different pieces and how much they cost. Additionally, there will be some added effects of cost, depending on if you've used filtered water, it's really easy to clean if it's all nice and clean already, right? So there's only a $10 effect on that. But if it's something really dirty, you can imagine it's going to take some added filtering to do that. And so there would be added costs associated. And that's what this chart is showing you here. Um, and then lastly, as an extension for this particular lab, um, there is a part called settling where you can go ahead and create a step before your multimedia filter. This part is what we were talking about, how we can let those pieces settle um, down before we put it into our filter. So is there a way we can kind of slow it down beforehand, let all the junk go to the bottom, all that cinnamon and pepper, and then take cleaner water out into our filter? So there's some equations in there that talk about how quickly a particle can settle on Earth's gravity. So check that out. And then lastly, here's our clarifier pictures. So go ahead and check those out. And if you have any questions as you do it, um, let us know. You can see up on the screen, we have the different areas such as environmental, chemical, civil engineering, and material science for you to check out as you go. So good luck making your designs. And we'll be back here in just a little bit. Thanks so Bye. much, guys. Thank you so much, Betsy. I want to say that was an amazing introduction. I hope you guys are ready to make some, build some water filters. Please don't make too much mess for your teachers, guys. Try and keep it neat. <laughs> um, we are going. Well, I want to say welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a lot of fun getting your build and designs underway. I hope that water is getting clean. Uh, we have our Q&A now with our two amazing college mentors on the line. This is uh, your session, really. They're going to be here to facilitate. This is your opportunity to engage with them, to ask any questions that you have about your designs, to ask any questions you have about college and what it's really like studying engineering in college. And today we have two amazing mentors with us. I'm going to stop speaking because they are the stars of the show. Uh, so we're going to pass it off to Emily and Brianna. And who's going to be lead starting it off, uh, ladies? I'm going to be sharing screen so I can get started right now. Um, so just give me one second to start sharing this back. Sure. All righty, everybody. So as Monica said, um, we're going to jump right into the Q&A. So we're going to first introduce ourselves, just so you know who's talking to you today. Um, and we're going to kind of give you a, a timeline of what we did in high school, where we are now. Um, so I'll let Brianna introduce herself in a second. But again, just start thinking of those questions that you want to ask us. Um, they can really be about anything, college, engineering, high school, um, anything like that. 
that you want to know answers to. Um, and this looks really well when we get engagement from you all. Um, so start thinking of those questions. I know there's a lot of you, so I hope there's a lot of questions. So with that, I'll introduce myself. So hi, everybody. My name is Emily. I am a senior at Columbia University studying mechanical engineering with a minor in earth and environmental engineering. I'm originally from California, and now I go to school in New York. So a lot of fun. If y'all have questions about going to school out of state, I know Brianna is also an out of state student, so we can definitely answer those types of questions. Um, particularly, I'm interested in renewable energy, so things like electric vehicles, solar power, things like that. Also interested in product development, which is working with customers to better understand their needs and wants and creating devices for them that help alleviate their day to day issues. Um, and I'm also interested in roller coasters, designing roller coasters. So there's definitely a lot you can do with mechanical engineering if any of you all want to talk about that. Um, so just to kind of give you a timeline of um, how I got to where I am, I guess. Um, so in high school, um, I my school was pretty under resourced. We didn't have like a ton of uh, like resources or clubs that were like engineering oriented, uh, but we did have a few like classes, I guess, that were more like design oriented. Um, and when one of those classes, I built an electric vehicle from reverse fuel cells for like my senior uh, project at the end. Um, so you, some of you all might be familiar with our engineering tomorrow um, electric vehicle club. So it was very similar, but instead it ran on like hydraulics, or not hydraulics, um, hydrosis, which was a really cool process of splitting water mo of molecules and converting that energy into like kinetic energy. So it was a lot of fun. Um, and then I took some engineering uh, college classes through one of the state schools that, at, that was available. So that was kind of what I did in high school that was more engineering oriented. Um, and then th this past time that I've past few years that I've been at Columbia, um, I participated in a program with NASA, which we basically did um, like project proposals and we made like a like a model of a rover that um, they could potentially use to take different samples um, from like Mars, for example, which was a lot of fun. Um, I entered at Con Edison to learn more about like energy conservation technology. So helping um, different buildings invest in renewable energy in their facilities so that they could be uh, more eco-friendly and have less of a uh, carbon footprint. And then this past summer I did, or two summers ago, I did um, 3D modeling of rat reproductive systems to understand the biomechanics of like tissues and understanding the different stages of pregnancy through and kind of correlating that to like um, human birth and kind of that, um, what is the word, like that system. Um, and now currently I am planning on going to graduate school here at Columbia to continue my um, education in mechanical engineering. And I am thinking about maybe doing a concentration in energy systems. Engineers have fun too, right? We do do a lot of cool projects like you can see here. Um, this one in the upper left-hand corner is a solar panel that my team and I made that is basically tracks the sun. So when we think about solar panels, we think about them like being on top of a roof or something like that. I mean, obviously that's not very, um, it's, it's not very efficient because obviously the sun moves throughout the day. So basically this system um, tracks the sun as, as it moves throughout the day. So it's more efficient, which I thought was a lot of fun. Um, this picture here is me and Bella, who was another Engineering Tomorrow intern. Um, during the summer, we worked on an oil and gas lab and they actually, the company that we were working with actually flew us out to Texas. So it was a lot of fun to be able to see the plants running. Um, and then just some like fun things that I'm a part of. Um, this was me and Glee Club when I was started in my first year. Um, I ran a track and field team at a middle school last year. So this is me and my my middle schoolers. Um, this is the project that I had done in high school that in this little blue thing is that thing that captured the water and then split it. So a lot of cool things that um, I'm really passionate and engaged in. So if any of y'all have questions about anything that I talked about, if you wanna talk about anything, let me know. Um, but I'll let Brianna introduce themselves now. Um, hi everyone, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, my name is Brianna Mahan and I am a freshman at the University of Miami studying civil engineering and minoring in Spanish. Um, right now with Engineering Tomorrow, I'm just a college mentor, but when I was in high school, um, I was in this program for engineering and architecture and we actually got to do a lot of the Engineering Tomorrow lab, so that's how I kind of got into the program. And my interest in engineering includes structural engineering and project management and just some things I'm involved at. Um, involved with, excuse me, here at school is the American Society of Civil Engineers and the National Society of Black Engineers. You can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, and then not ex as extensive as Emily, because I'm sort of just getting into the bulk of my college experience, but um, some things that I participated in in high school were, again, that program for engineering, architecture, and design for the common good. Um, one thing that my high school has us do is um, our senior independent project is based on what program you're in. So for my senior independent project, I designed um, and I just redesigned a sustainable houseboat um, to make it affordable for low income families. Um, and there's a couple of pictures of that on the next slide, which I'll get into. And then here at um, Miami, still my first year, but again, I'm in the National Society of Black Engineers, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and I will be attending the um, American Society of Civil Engineers Student Symposium in March of 2023, which is basically just a student led competition. And there's a whole bunch of different um, competitions that you can enroll in, but what they were doing is the concrete canoe. So basically from now until March, we um, are building a concrete canoe, um, like totally from scratch. And whoever can get to the other side of this lake in Jacksonville um, wins a prize. So I'm pretty excited for that. Um, and if you go to the next slide, these are just some photos of things that I've done mostly from high school, but um, the photo on the left side is um, was me present presenting, excuse me, my senior independent project on houseboats, and I created a plan and included um, some different aspects of the houseboat. And then the top pictures are from um, the summer immer immersion program that I did with the program in high school, and that's kind of how I got into civil engineering. Was we got to um, tour the site of this building in New York City. Um, that was in the process of being built and see all like the interior before it's been finished. Um, and I'm from Westchester, New York. So I see a couple of New York schools. It's 425 Park Avenue, if you ever see it. Um, it was actually pretty cool to go visit that. And then the bottom right corner is just another project that we worked on um, during that program with solar panels. And I think it was one of the Engineering Tomorrow Labs, but like a little different, but it was um, using solar panels to power fans. Um, so yeah, those are just some things I've been involved in, and I'm very excited to get into the Q&A part of this. See, some people had, um, some schools had put some questions in the chat, um, and the first one I see is, how did you decide which college you wanted to attend? Um, and for me, it was a couple factors, I believe. One of my biggest things was the size of the school, because if I'm from Westchester and I see Ursuline, so you know that I went to Holy Child and it was a fairly small school. Um, so I didn't want to jump into college and be like in a school of 40,000 people. I just didn't think that was the right fit for me. So size of the school was definitely a factor. Um, and also just the program. Um, obviously, engineering, it, like a lot of schools have engineering, but not a lot of the engineering. Um, schools are very small and I feel like Miami had a rather small college of engineering which I liked so then you can sort of get to know everyone across all engineering majors not just the ones that are in um, your specific major um, and I think the last thing for me was location um, I hate the cold <laughs> um, so Miami obviously is never cold really uh, except for maybe like one week in December um, so I'd say those are the three factors that sort of paid played the most part in choosing which college I wanted to attend. Emily. Yeah, um, yeah, I just want to resonate. I would definitely say location too. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, so very warm uh, area, right, of the US. So I actually wanted to like experience some of the seasons. I wanted to see the leaves change. I wanted to see snow. Um, and that's what I definitely got in New York. So that was something that I wanted to do. But other than like the seasons and that types of things that come with location, um, just like the opportunities, right? So for example, because I'm in New York, I have so many opportunities to do so many different things, whether that is engineering and getting internships that are literally 15 minutes away from campus because I live so close to the city, or if it's being able to go to free Broadway shows all the time. I'm going to a free one next week. I went to a show like a couple of weeks ago. Um, so definitely a lot of opportunities to engage within the city is one of the reasons why I wanted to go to school in New York. Um, I would also say another thing was um, that the diversity of the student population was really important to me. So being a woman of color within engineering, definitely wanted to go to a school that was supportive of that, both of women in engineering, women in STEM generally, um, and supporting students of color that are first gen low income like myself. And Columbia has definitely been able to provide for me that way. We are 50-50 um, in the first incoming year of uh, female and male. So compared to the national average of only 20% of women in, in engineering school. So that was something that was really important to me to see how they're trying to change industry by changing who's being educated within these fields, right? Um, and then also there's just so much 
um, re so many resources here that I think really helped me be successful, whether they're like academic, social, financial, all of those resources um, have been really, you know, obviously helpful in helping me be able to get to who I am after, you know, four years of being here. Um, and then the last thing that I would say that really brought me to like Columbia specifically was, you know, obviously the, the facilities, right? So we have uh, really big spaces that students can just be creative and ingenuitive. We get receive a lot, a lot, a lot of funding. Um, so we never have to worry about like, oh, am I going to have access to this thing? Or um, how can I build this thing if we don't have that, that machine or something like that? We have so much money to like give to students uh, for their projects. So my senior design team for example has $1,500 within our budget um, and that's only one team if there's like 16 17 teams and each team gets that amount of budget so a really fun stuff because we have so many things that we can work with um, but yes definitely keep your questions coming uh, we will answer as many as we can within the next 18 minutes or so that we're here um, so somebody asked what advice do you have for us that you wish somebody had told you prior to attending college um, I would say <clears throat> probably Learning how to advocate for yourself is really important. Um, I think in my high school experience, it was always just like the teachers were looking out for me um, and they wanted me to, you know, do the best that I could, which is not to say that that doesn't happen in college. It's just that college classes are tend to be bigger. So they have to worry about more students. You know what I mean? So um, it's really important to advocate for yourself if you are, you know, you get a certain grade on the test and you're like, wait a minute. I don't, I'm, this might be right. It's very possible that they might have graded it wrong. Or if you're looking at a homework and it wasn't clear enough, you can advocate like, hey, I think I deserve, you know, two points off. I don't know who's, uh, okay. You can, uh, so for example, you can say like, oh, I, I feel like I deserve these two points because the problem wasn't really clear, you know, things like that. Like the, le the worst they can say is like, no. And you're like, okay, at least I tried, you know, but a lot of times ten professors tend to be uh, flexible and they want to work with you so I would say really just advocating for yourself in the academic setting but also in your like social and um, other settings as well so if you are you know first gen low income like myself advocating for yourself in different spaces where you know for example at Columbia it gets really cold right because we're in New York um, so advocating for finan to financial aid saying like hey I need money to buy a winter coat and they can try to help you out or try to find like, a donation center or something like that so really just knowing your own needs and seeking help when you need it but Brianna what are what is some advice that maybe you would wish you had heard yeah um one thing that i have I completely agree with what you said, but one thing specifically that I've had to learn, not even just like last semester, probably in the last month, is that your grades aren't everything. Um, and in college, it's very different from high school. In high school, everyone's very focused on what did you get on this test and being a straight A student and getting those grades up so you, you can then apply to colleges and, you know, have um, like your GPA. I saw someone ask a question about GPA. Um, but having a high GPA, so it makes you stand out amongst these colleges. Um, and that's something that I've had a lot of um, trouble, excuse me, um, accepting because, you know, going from being like a straight A student to then getting, you know, B's and like low B's in, high, um, in college um, is definitely something that is, is hard to accept, I would say. But in college, it's more about like the experience. And while during your first year, you're probably not going to have like the best internship over the summer, even internship at all. Once you start getting that experience and getting into the field of engineering or whatever your major may be, it more becomes about that rather than the grades that you're holding. And um, I'm not saying <laughs> don't focus on your grades at all and just fail out of college, you know, but if you need that help, go to the call, go to office hours, get a tutor, um, you know, even with tutoring, like I had never had a tutor before in high school and now I didn't do well in physics last semester. So now I have a physics tutor and that's just something that you have to sort of adjust to. Um, so just sort of accepting that your grades don't define you um, is probably one thing that I'd say get used to now. So then once you get to college, it's not like such a shell shock. Um, let's see. Someone else asked, would a store bought drinking straw work better? And I assume this is about um, the lab itself. Well, I'd say when I did the lab, I didn't use a straw. Um, so Emily, I'm not sure if, I know you were in one of the breakout rooms. I'm not sure if you have any advice on this. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the question is asking, like um, what straw, 
they're referring to. Um, so if you want to clarify uh, Woodmont High School, let us know because I'm not exactly sure. But I mean, you might be talking about like that filtration trial um, that we saw earlier in like the first presentation. Um, it's kind of, I think it was called like life straw or something like that. And basically it's like, if you're, let's say, hiking and you need a water resource and water is too heavy to carry, but there's a river right next to you. You can carry this like kind of straw that has basically like a filter within it that cleans the water. Um, so comparing that to like just a normal drinking straw might not be great because it's not going to have the filter, but um, they do sell them at like different outing outdoor um, like retail stores or they sell them at on Amazon for like not that expensive. So if you want one, yeah. Good stuff out there. Alrighty, continue the questions, folks. These are really great. Um, so somebody asked what GPA is needed to get into a good engineering school. So there's a lot of things to unpack in this question. Uh, I think the first thing that I wanna talk about is a good engineering school. What does it mean to be a good engineering school? Um, I think Brianna and I kind of already talked a little bit about this, but to say it a little bit more explicitly, a good engineering school is one that's good for your needs. Um, a good engineering school shouldn't be just the name and you're like, oh, that's a good school. It should be a school that's fitting for you. So let's say Columbia has a, a reputation of being a good school, right? But if you don't like New York City, it's not gonna be a good school for you. So it's not what a good school is generally. It should be what's good for you. So you really wanna think about what are you trying to have for yourself and try to sit down with yourself and say like, what's important to me? Is it location? Is it diversity? Is it financial aid? Is it being close to home? Is it being abroad? Is it a specific major that you know you wanna go into and you wanna make sure that the school offers that, right? Um, and then in terms of like GPA, once you kind of narrow it down, you can then kind of start seeing like schools average GPAs of when they accept of their incoming first year students. Um, but again, like that shouldn't be like a deterior in any way. Like I, I just keep going back to Columbia because that's what I know, right? So like for Columbia, I think their like GPA of their incoming average students is like four point something on like a five point scale or four point something scale. Um, so like and if you have like a 3.6, let's say, um, that shouldn't deter you from still applying. It's just what their average is. Um, but I would say that the application process overall is very holistic. It's looking at your GPA. It's looking at your test scores if you choose to submit those. It's looking at your essay responses. It's looking at your extracurriculars, your leadership. What are you doing outside of school? What do your teachers have to say about you and their recommendations? There's so many different things that are just outside of a GPA um, that really are considered. What classes are you taking? Are you taking all of the AP classes that your high school offers? And maybe that's why you're struggling a little bit. Um, those are all really important things Things to put into context for looking in your application. Um, but that's all I have to say about that. And it went on a, a little ramp because I work in admissions and I think it's really important to stress to high school students, it's not just about your GPA. There's so many other things that make you a unique student that you should also be focusing on. Um, but Brianna, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, honestly, no, I think you touched on both points that I was going to talk about. But even like, Again, I'll talk about Miami because that's what I know, but Miami doesn't necessarily have the best reputation. You know, we're known to be a party school and you're in Miami and Miami's crazy. However, um, the College of Engineering at Miami is one of the reasons why I came to Miami because it was small and it was, you get to know all your professors very well and you get to know all your fellow um, engineering majors and you get to work with your peers and they have a lot of resources. So in terms of a good engineering school, I would definitely say there is no such thing as a good engineering school. It's what's good for you, like Emily said. And then again, with GPA, I'm not sure quite, I'm sure we have a ra um, range of ages here, but when you start getting to the college process, all your advisors and everyone's going to tell you it is genuinely a holistic approach. Um, I did not have a 4.0 GPA. However, I got into a bunch of schools that I never thought I would get into. And one thing I would um one thing I would recommend, and not just to not repeat everything that Emily said, um, is that definitely try to step out of your comfort zone, because I applied to a lot of schools, Miami being one of them, that I didn't think I was going to get into, and I was just doing it because I like the school, and I like the program, and I wanted to go there, and even though, you know, maybe my, my test scores and my GPA weren't the highest, I felt like there were other parts of my application that made up for that. <clears throat> So even if you're not 100% confident that you're going to get into your top school, apply, you know, again, it may not, it may hurt a little if you don't get in, um, but definitely try to step outside of your comfort zone a lot because you never know what's going to happen. 
I see another question. What is your engineering major like as a first year student? When do you declare your major and when do you start taking classes for your major? Um, so right now, I would say my experience as a first year engineering major has been pretty like base level, I would say. You don't get really into the like heart of your engineering classes until like your sophomore year. But honestly, right now I'm taking one class that's specific to my major and environmental engineering and um, architectural engineering that I didn't think I was going to be taking now. So that's pretty exciting. It's not necessarily like a hands-on class where you're building things and you're, you know, solving problems. You're more learning about like a specific field of civil architectural and um, environmental engineering. Um, but compared to other schools where you have to take all these like core curriculum and, you know, your English and if you go to um, a religious school, your religion classes and stuff like that, um, you probably wouldn't get into it. Um, this early and then for Miami you declare you can declare your major when you apply to the school or you can go engineering undecided and I believe declare during your sophomore year um, but again that's going to vary for every school but one thing you can look at if you're really interested in like when you are going to start taking engineering specific classes um, a lot of schools have like if you go into a specific major, they have a four-year plan of like what classes you'll take when. So that's something I would recommend um, looking at because that can definitely help and maybe influence your decision on where you're gonna go. <clears throat> yeah, it's been it's been a bit of a second since I was in my first year um, back in 2019. Um, but I would definitely say that I was chaotic in my first year. Uh, I think I was just trying to do everything because that's what I had been in high school. Um, but as we kind of talked about through the theme of maybe today's Q&A, the high school is very different from college, right? For a lot of different reasons. Um, and one of those being that in, in college, you tend to be more focused on what you're actually interested in. Uh, so in high school, you know, I was a part of all these clubs that I really wasn't interested in, but I thought, you know, well, I just need to have these on my application to boost me. And, you know, I definitely learned that it's quality over quantity, right? Just because you're a part of 15 clubs um, doesn't mean that you're really having an impact in them. But if you're maybe a part of two clubs where you have leadership roles in them and you, you're, you know, you're more than just like a member of the club. Um, that speaks a lot more. So uh, another piece of advice for students who maybe are feeling that way or feel that pressure to be a part of everything. Um, so in high school, in college, I was a little bit, I was, it was a little crazy. Um, but again, I kind of had to sit down with myself into like maybe a month of my first year and say like, look, this is, you're, you're doing too much. You're being crazy. You need to think about what's really important important to you and stick with those things and everything else can be put on the back burner you can be like you can maybe go to like once a meeting if you want to go things like that um and then in, in my school nobody is declared when they first come in so you put on your application classes that you might or a major that you might be interested in but you don't declare until your first semester of second year um, and that's just to help students explore the different fields of engineering like even though you think you might want to go into mechanical let's say if you've never explored electrical engineering maybe that's something that you're interested in so it just kind of encourages students to um, explore different cons uh, different classes and things like that all righty i think we have about six more minutes so if we have any other questions bring them in i think we have one more right now um and somebody asked how did you know engineering was a good career for you and i would say that i knew it was good for me because i really like to tinker and i really like understanding how things work um so if that kind of resonates with you engineering might be a good field for you if you want to help the world by being creative and having that freedom and being encouraged to step out of you know, the norms and think outside the box, then engineering might be good for you. If you like working with people and problem solving, and um, I think what's also really cool about engineering overall is that it's very interdisciplinary. So if that's something that you like, you know, engineering is good for you. Um, for folks who maybe don't know what interdisciplinary means, it just means like working with multiple fields, right? So engineers, they can't just go into a city and say, we're building a bridge right here, right? They need to be able to know who's in that community, think about urban planning, think about the economics. If this is this bridge viable, um, you know, all of those different careers interact with each other to make a project that they think is really beautiful. Uh, but Brianna, how did you know that you wanted to get into engineering? 
You know, I'll be honest, I don't know right now. I am still in my first year. I'm taking very general classes, except for that one class that I mentioned before. Um, I think it is. And I, I what I do know is that there's parts of engineering um, and parts of the major that I absolutely love, like the hands-on work, the teamwork, the problem solving and all that. Like, I know I like that part, um, but I don't think you can really know until you sort of get into like the thick of it. Um, but in terms of like ways that I sort of got to this point, um, just like exploring in high school, I was in not like engineering um, clubs in high school, but I did, um, there's this thing called the Fuller Center, which is like your, you build um, house, affordable houses for low income families. And I liked that. And um, just exploring through that program that I was in in high school, the different fields of engineering, I got to see, oh, okay, I don't like biomedical and you know, I'm not really good at the computer stuff, you know, <laughs> but I like the building and I like designing. Um, so just kind of, again, exploring. And I feel like this also goes back to something I wanted to say for the last question. Since during your first year, you're probably not gonna be taking engineering specific classes. It's a good time to join those clubs and explore um, like, you know, there's the Amer there's a society of, I think, biomedical engineers and civil engineers and architectural engineering institute. Um, so joining clubs like that, even if like you like you go in saying, hey, I want to be biomedical, but you don't know for sure. That's a good time since you're not in like those really, really difficult classes to explore. And maybe that will inspire you to change your major or explore something else. Um, but I would say just the exploring part and um, dabbling into each different field of engineering, each different um, sector of engineering is how I got to engineering and how, um, why I think it is a good career for me right now, but I honestly don't think I'll know for maybe another year. <laughs> well, I'm going to hop in. I don't think there are any additional questions and we have about two minutes left. I just want to say thank you to Emily and Brianna for leading such a great Q&A. I think the questions were amazing from our groups that are here. Thank you for your engagement. Love, love, love the questions. And if you have any additional questions, I will let you know that our mentors are going to be back inside the breakout rooms to help you. Uh, there oh, we just opened the breakout rooms. Uh, they're going to be back in the breakout rooms to assist you with your designs. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to hop in there. And um, there is one other thing I want to say. I shared my screen and we are going to just remind you all that we are going to. I want to say welcome back. We have about a minute before uh, our wrap up officially gets underway, just in case some other uh, schools have logged out and are coming back in at 1230. We're going to give them just till 1230 to start. But for those of you who are here, I want to say we are ready to see what you guys have created. I think there's going to be some uh, Betsy, is there going to be some Slido in the wrap up too? I just saw Slido. I don't know if that was from the last one or not. <laughs> yes, 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 this is a new one. Yeah. All right, so fantastic. Our... <laughs> For those of you who are with us, if you want to hop into Slido, we will be using that shortly. But all right, it's 1230. So it's officially our wrap up. So this is our time, your time, really. This is your show, because I know Betsy's going to want to hear from you all. So please, just so that we make sure that everybody who is here and wants to participate, we get to kind of spotlight you. You guys can raise your hand when you're ready to show us your work. But I'm going to pass it off to Betsy to start our water treatment wrap up. Yes, you guys, it's an honor to be back here again with you. How awesome. Um, I just wanted to mention that after I had finished working with NASA, one of my biggest dreams was to help other people achieve their dreams. And so it's an honor to be in your classroom today to talk about water treatment and any engineering questions you may have. Um, so let's jump right in. I want to know how it went. Who would love to show your designs? Um, you're welcome to come forward. I'm going to ask some questions for you, like what materials did you use and what orders did you place them? So if you want to stick that in either the chat or Slido, I would love to see it. So right. anyone like to go first? You're probably all logging in, so I'll give you a second. I see, I see a lot of students that look ready. <laughs> Let's see if they're out. Oh, Cardinal Hayes, I saw a hand up. Cardinal Hayes, are you ready to share? Yes. All right. I'm going to spotlight you. And if you can unmute so we can hear the gentleman from the classroom, it would be amazing. Let me see if I can. There you are. We can hear you now. Hi. Oh. I. <laughs> 
I was gonna send a picture. Oh, oh wait, <laughs> it's, uh, water. It's pretty clear, actually. It's super it clear, is. right, Betsy? It's amazing. That is so good. So, so tell me, what no. are your no. layers? What did you no, filter no. with? That's a huge question. Oh, uh, I used a lot of tissue. Like I used like almost a lot of tissue, and then I put cayenne, and then I put cayenne, I put um sand and rock, and then I put more cotton at the top of it to fill it. Very nice. Oh, I love that. And so one of the things that those tissues have very similar to reverse osmosis are some of like the pores, similar to the pores in our face, but like pores in a water filter, right? Like this. And so I bet that is why one of the reasons that all of your particles look like they're getting out and that looks super clean. Did you calculate the turbidity uh, looking at how dirty it was to start versus how it is now? Oh, the Oh, yay, I can't wait to see it. Oh, yes, the before is really different, significant. Here, shake it, shake wow, it you guys, look at that. Oh, my goodness. That is so incredible. Way to go. Your team did a wonderful job. High five. Yay. <laughs> Good work. Great job, right. Cardinal Hayes, and thanks for sharing. It looks like several of you guys have answered some in the Slido here. I'm going to go ahead and share some of the answers. So lots of tissues, rocks, sand, duct tape. Oh, that's a new one. I love that idea. And some cotton balls. Um, and then anyone else see anything else you'd like to say or show? Anybody? I see Hudson Catholic. I, oh, Norfolk Technical. I'm going to spotlight you. You guys want to unmute? I see you showing your results here. Please yes. unmute so we can hear from you all. Can your teacher unmute for us? No? Maybe they just wanted to show us their water. They're not gonna, oh, there they go. Oh, come back we are. so we can see you. Yeah, yeah. Come on up. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, very nice. We have, we have. That's the dirty water in the Gatorade bottle, yes? Yes. Awesome. And then over on the right that I'm seeing, what, can, what are your layers? Um, I put cotton balls, and then I put sand on top of that, and then I put rocks, and then I put a filter. Very good. Very good. I love it. And did you have, did you test how much you could get out in 60 seconds? Um, like a few tablespoons, like it was like 10 ish. Very good. Oh my goodness. And did you have to adjust the flow rate at all? Um, just a little bit. I didn't pour it like all of it once. I just did it slowly. Gotcha. And when you poured it, did you kind of let it set at the top and then let it come out and then add some more? Yeah, I waited. I like waited until like it went through the system and then I poured a little more. Very nice. And I saw you taped it too. Look at you. So smart. Cause I was afraid it would be slippery too. I love it. Very good. If you had to do it again, is there anything that you would change and do differently this time? Um, I maybe would have tried it without the filter, see what it would have done. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing. I love it. Your water looks really nice and clear. Good job. Thank you. Great job, Norfolk. Who's next? I see a lot of movement on cameras, but I don't know who to pin next. Oh, Waltrip, are your hands up, Waltrip? Yes? All right, I'm gonna pin Waltrip. Can you unmute Waltrip? <laughs> Hi, Waltrip. Yeah, okay, can you guys hear me? We can hear sure you. Can. All right, so um, <laughs> we didn't do well <laughs> for the most part. So, well, I, our, my team at least. So, we, we got, can we show your design? Yeah, so this is, this is, hang on one sec. This sure, is, this sure. is the water. And they got it, okay. they got it pretty clear. And I don't know much about it. So, why don't you guys talk? <laughs> don't be shy. Come on up. I think you guys did a good job from what I saw there. Like with the rocks, every okay. after it used to be clean, we like rinsed it off kind of. Yeah. And then we have a cotton ball right here, and then we have the rocks, and then on the top we had a, a paper towel, and then here we have a couple 
pieces of paper towel. And then like right here, we had more paper towels. <laughs> Very nice. So you had like multiple filters, it looks like. Um, so not not all in one container, but like two different containers that were doing the filtering. It's like a multi-stage process. I love it. So good. That was really nice. Would is there anything that you would do differently next time? And we didn't like use too many paper towels. So next time, and like to speed up the process, we would do we would clean this out and use more paper towels. Gotcha. All right, perfect. And I love it. That's so good. And one of the questions or one of the comments that you guys had made that you didn't think you did good, but it looked really nice and clean to me and that you had changed the turbidity quite a bit. Um, another thing about engineering, anything that you do, even if it doesn't do exactly what you wanted to at the beginning, you've learned from it. And that is already a win, I think. So great job, you guys. Is there anyone else who would like to go ahead and show us? Ursuline yeah. had their line, their hand up. Um, you guys can unmute and sh show us. Let's see what you what you guys did today. Okay. Hi. Okay. This is it. This is our <laughs> filter. We got a good bit of water actually in the sixteen thing. So we did a cotton ball at the bottom, and then a coffee filter, and then we did like a bit of rocks, another coffee filter. We kind of like mixed them up, doing cotton ball coffee filter stones and layers. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. That was our, Very that was just a Where did you Look at the it? difference in the turbidity. That is so good. You guys are doing awesome. I am so impressed. You guys are blowing this out of the water, everyone. And no pun intended, right? <laughs> Great work. <laughs> All right, so as people are coming forward to share, one of the questions on Slido was like, how clean is your water? Look at that. 78% of you are showing me that you have five or less. And remember from the World Health Organization, that was what we were aiming for in order to be drinkable. Super job. All right, I'm going to stop right. sharing so I could see who's being highlighted. That's yes. hello. You guys, Upper Moreland, you can unmute so we can hear you. Let's go. Hi. Hey. So uh, this is our original. Can you guys see the original? How dark it is? Very dark. Oh, yeah, that looks muddy almost. Yeah. And then we had a uh, very clear after result. Very nice. Look at that. Okay, and tell me about your layers. What layers did you use? So we started out on the bottom with some pebbles on a coffee filter. And then we went another layer with some sand on a coffee filter. And it uh, filtered out really well. Very good. And did you choose... Um, putting in the coffee filter, like how, how did you decide to use that one? So we kind of decided to use it because we thought it would like suck it up, like kind of all like the bad parts of it. And we thought the sand would really filter it out well, which it ended up doing. So like, I guess that's our process. Perfect, perfect. And if you think about how coffee filters are made, you know, they are made to be porous and let the coffee water go through. So perfect. That was a great thought. You guys, good job. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. I have East Harlem Scholars Academy had their hand up. You guys ready? There they are. Yeah. So this is the first one. This is the first one that we did. It didn't go as clear. We did uh, a coffee filter, um, sand, a rock, and uh, cotton balls. This is this is the second one though. We did a coffee filter, uh, paper towels. Sand, rock, sand again, then um, a bunch more cotton balls. Right. And why do you think the second design worked better than the first? Like, what qualities about the media do you think helped in that one? Um, we added more fil um, we added more filters and more layers. So it wait, we added more layers, so it had more it, um, filtered out more. Very nice. Very nice. So yeah, those layers and adding, I think you said you added a paper towel as well, right? Yeah. Um, which wasn't in your other one. Very good. And more cotton balls than the other one. Mm -hmm. So things that are going to absorb those like bigger chunks of the pepper. What a good idea. Thank nice you. job. Excuse me. 
Thank you, East Harlem. All right, we have uh, Cabrini next. Let me remove this spotlight. And Cabrini in Wisconsin would like to share. You guys are Hello. up, can you unmute? Are we unmuted? You should be unmuted. There you go. We can hear you now. <laughs> so this was our before. Very dirty. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then this is our after we put into a bag because it started to crumble. Yeah. Down. <laughs> So totally, the first layer yeah. we had rocks and a coffee filter. Uh, the second layer we had cotton balls, and then the third layer we had paper towels and some more coffee filters. Very nice. So you had multiple layers of coffee multiple filters. Layers. Did you use multiple kip kits in the same one, or did you fold it over and cut the original one? Um, we used like multiple. Yeah, we used multiple. Awesome. Oh, that was a good idea because you have multiple people in your group. So you could do that. Yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Is there anything that you would do differently next time? Uh, I think we should have added sand. I think that would have helped. Okay. Okay. The course or the fineness really of the sand getting in there. So good thinking. Next time, if you do that, take a picture and send it to us. We would love to see it. Okay. All right. All right. Great work. All right. Maybe we have. We have Monsignor Farrell who has their hand raised. Can you guys unmute? Okay. Yes, hi, we're here. Hi. Uh, hi. First, uh, I just wanted to say that I think it's crazy that you're in space. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> but we got the whole space. Second of all, yeah, I mean, ours is not really a spaceship, but it looks like it. So uh, our goal was speed here. So we had three uh, bottle, bottle tops, right? Yeah, we had coffee filters right here. And then we filled it with gravel sand. I think the this gravel is on the bottom. Yeah, we put well first we did cotton balls and then we did <laughs> gravel and sand. So then we poured the water through on all three on the top. And uh this was our result. Pretty clear. We got a little door, uh dirty water in the beginning, and then it started running pretty much clear. Yeah, so, that so was it. what we did here too, we glued, we cut a hole here. And yeah, we glued we a hot we put a yeah, cap we, we hot glued a gun. <laughs> cap on. <laughs> we hot glued a cap on. So then we made a nozzle. So when we were done, we could pour our water out like that. Um, and we made a little stand. That's about it. Very good. You guys, I love this design. This is one of the most unique ones I have seen. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, we kind of tried. Trying. I <laughs> want to, I'm we really wanted to impress you guys. So. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. I have a question for you. So yes. when you were trying to get as much as possible, as quick as possible, what was your thought in that? We thought that basically if we could make a device that would capture the water from three bottles at once, more water would process more quickly. So that was kind of the thought That's process. Fun. So here, I mean, the cardboard's kind of blocking it, but we have three separate, like yeah. we cut three different bottles, you can, right? Well, you will the three, the the three tops see. are these, mm -hmm. and then the three yeah. bottoms are connected. And then we taped them together and hot glued those. So yeah, that was basically the whole design. So the bottom is all one connected together. Yeah, the bottom's all connected. We should have prefaced that statement, but yeah. Good. I think it's great because, you know, time is money. And the longer it takes for us to process this water, we won't be able to help the people that need it. So great work, you guys. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have uh, HD Woodson. You had your hand up. You guys are up. Are you ready? Hi, come on up. Oh, we can't hear you. Can you get a little closer to the microphone? Okay, that's your before water, I see. Yeah, and it has those chunks at the top. Very nice. Look at all about these future engineers. It's awesome. Look how clean that water is. So I got a question for you. Would you drink that water? It looks under five uh, or less. Yeah. If you had, yeah. had to, awesome. That's the perfect answer because you know what? If we needed it, we would have it. And you guys now have the theory and the knowledge of how to help yourselves if we ever did need more water. So great work, I love it. Okay, and tell me, let me see, what filter did you use? Can you bring it just a teeny bit closer at all or? Okay, I, oh, I see the pebbles in there and it looks like some coffee filters and layering again, like that multimedia that we were talking very nice very nice i like it great work All thanks right. you guys dunbar had their hand up dunbar are you ready 
Dunbar, can you unmute? Oh, here they come. I see them. <laughs> Hi, Dunbar. How you doing? Good. Let's see. How did it go? This was, this was our dirty water. Very nice. I like it. Was, uh, <laughs> final product. Very good. You guys, looking at your original dirty water, what was your turbidity of that? Do you know? Did you, like when you took it on the scale? Um, I'm not sure. So it looks pretty dark. Mine was pretty dark too from the uh, slides that you saw. I would guess that's probably like 150 or something like that. Um, I don't have it right up next to me, but wow, look at the difference from before. And then what did you get it as after? Did you check its turbidity there too? No, we didn't. Okay, so it's probably around five-ish or something. Can you believe that? That change is incredible. All right, so your filter, what was the multimedia layers? We um used the cotton balls at the bottom, but as yeah. our filter, we had the tissue and we used like two of them and we tied it with the rubber band. Then we put the um dirt and the pebbles in. Oh, cool. That's so smart that you use the rubber bands to kind of keep it all together too. Mm -hmm. I noticed when I was making mine, um, towards like the bottom part of it, it was kind of coming out to the, the end of the cap. So what a great idea. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. All right, and yeah. I know Hudson Catholic wanted to be up next. I'm going to pin yeah. them for everybody. H Hudson Catholic, you ready? Hey there. Hi. Love you. This is ours. Sorry, oh, water filter. Hold on, I'm trying to like show you so it's clear. Oh, it's very clear. Thank you. <laughs> All right, yeah. I noticed that those are those paper towels, tissues, coffee filters. Yeah, those are tissues. Very nice. Did you use like, um, how many would you guess? 10, 20, 40? It was 40. It was 40 okay, so somewhere around 40. Yeah, Very yeah. good. Is there anything other than tissues in your filter? Yeah, um, there's rocks and then there's sand on top. Very what nice. Kind of Very nice. And how did you choose to use tissues in addition to what was in your kit? I think it's a great idea. Oh, we use coffee filters. Um, no, we just, we oh. just put it so it could like go through, so it could soak up most of the water, just clear through after. Perfect. So it's going to soak up some of that water. And in doing so, soaking up some of those like contaminants like that cinnamon and the pepper too, right? So way to go. Yeah. I love it. And that water looks super clear. High five to you guys. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. Oh, we have Our Lady of Lords raised their hand, but I don't see their camera on. Can you put on your camera so we can see you all? <laughs> Let's see. Um, Our Lady of Lords, you, you, you hopping in? There we go. While they're coming up, there is a question in Slido for you. Um, a lot of you have I've asked it, but go ahead and tell me what would you change to make your water even cleaner this time? All right, go ahead, Our Lady of Lords. Hi. All right, take it away, guys. Wait, what was, oh. what was the question? What was just what we did. Filter. Okay, we put tissues and then we did um, rocks <laughs> and sand and cotton balls and then a filter. And then our water's pretty much clear. Like we didn't really have like an aesthetically pleasing one. <laughs> That's okay. You know what? Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't have to look good if it's doing what it needs to, right? No worries. Yeah, I got you a got question. The job done. You, have to, you have to peep the water though. Yeah. We went for a little fundamental, like more of a fundamental build <laughs> rather than like yeah. a like a like a, it's more basic. No worries. Basic work, doesn't it? It got the job done. It turned out pretty clear for us. Awesome. I have a question. Was this your final design or did you make an iteration to get to this design? Like, did you change anything to get here or was this your first? Uh, this was our first. No, our... after like three attempts. Well, we, we went to like the drawing boards. <laughs> we like sketched it out before. We sketched it out. Like we had, a, we had like a sketch guy do it for and us. The... And then uh, <laughs> this is our final product. I, I was the sketcher. Yeah, Marlo okay. sketched it out. And then, uh, we, you know, we, we put it into action. All right. Well, great work, you guys. I like that it came out so clean. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, great job, Our Lady of Lourdes. All right. We have somebody. I don't see the camera on. Um, oh, 
I now I just brought I just saw the chat. I'm gonna spotlight WCS2. They want to share. Course. Hey there. All right, man. There you go. So for this, I just use a lot of paper towels. Yep. And then it's just the dirty water. And then this one looks a lot more cleaner. Very nice. Okay, yeah. So those paper towels did a nice job of kind of absorbing some of those contaminants that we put in that water, didn't they? I got a question for you. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. What do you think would happen if you, you put that cleaner water back through the filter? Like if you could somehow undo it and then put it back through your filter, do you think it would get cleaner or would it be about the same? Yes, I think it would get cleaner. Yeah, okay, so I think so too. And I love the fact that you already have both your dirty and your clean water. So thank you so much for sharing. That looks great. Is there anything you would do differently? Um, I would maybe add more tissues or more some tissues. tissues in here. Okay, so more layers to that. Very nice, thank you. I think that's everybody who wanted to share. If you want to share, just raise your hand and we'll get right to you. And then if, okay. if we don't have anybody, Betsy, take it away. Yeah. Yes, of course. Okay. So just like I was asking in that last um, wonderful demonstration from our student, you know, if anyone had considered running the water back through it again. So I don't know why, but it came to me to do this. And when I did it, I was expecting it to get super clean, right? Like after it goes through once, I would have thought it would get even cleaner. But what I noticed was it did clean it, but not to the level that I thought it would. And so I was wondering if this were you and you're the company responsible for this, do you think you would pay to run it through your filters twice? Or do you think it's not making that big of a difference? going from it one time to two times. Give me a thumbs up or uh, feel free just to type in the chat. Yes, I would totally pay to run it through twice. Or no, it, it got cleaner for sure, more than what it was before. And I, I didn't see that much of a difference. I'm curious what you guys will say. Thumbs up, anyone? Would you run it through and pay for it to be done again in that one? Or would you change your filter? You might change a filter and do another one. I see okay. one thumbs down in Zoom, but I have a hand up from Duval, but their camera's not on. Duval, do you want to turn your camera on? Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's see if Duval turned on their camera. I'm sorry. I know you want to share a video. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. I can always um, send the link later. Um, no worries. Oh, they're not turning on their camera though. So go ahead and keep oh. rolling. <laughs> Here we go, here we go, guys. So this is International Space Station. Drinking baby. Balls, cameras on. Well, they rely on the water recovery system within ECLAS. Okay, and I am hearing that Duval's camera's on. So why don't we go ahead to them um, and see what they have to share. Hello, this is our dirty water and we have our clean water on this side. And for our model, we use um, coffee filters. We use like, I think four of them, then we wrapped rubber band around it. And we first layered um, pebbles about like the whole entire bag. It was like a little bag of pebbles. And then we put coarse sand on the next layer and we layered it off with cotton. Yes. On the top. Very nice. So you chose specifically lay separate layers over each other, ending with that cotton. Very good. Um, yes. Did you measure your turbidity of like the dirty water? How much was it? Um, the dirty water, it was about like half, like a like a little bit reaching half. Like we used more of this. We just had to make like another model of the dirty water. And um, most of the filter like took out the contents that made it dirty. And we only had like a little bit of the water that was left over. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. Looks good. I really think you did a nice job getting some of those contaminants out. So way to go. Thank you so much for sharing. Woo! Good work, guys. All right. Well, we are just about out of time here. Um, so I am going to wrap it on up. So um, there are some other things in space that we use water for that I wasn't sure you might think about, but growing our vegetables and being able to supply ourselves with any kinds of food that we might need long term, as well as our drinking water and using it for our food. Um, with that said, we also have a toilet and it needs a little bit of water for flush water as well, just like here on Earth. I want to leave you guys with one final thought before I introduce our next speaker. And that is a quote from Richard Branson. And he says that there is no greater thing that you can do with your life and your work than to follow your passions in a way that serves the world and you. And you guys, you just proved today that you can be the water treatment engineers of our future and, you know, help supply, you know, the world's most important resource to people who need it. So thank you so much for all of your awesome designs. It has been such a joy spending my morning with you all. Um, here we go. We are going to get ready to have Mr. Sanjay Patel here with us. He is a water engineer with experience in optimization algorithms and techniques that combine with simulation modeling platforms for city scale water distribution systems, focusing on reducing energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Sanjay is currently the co-founder and CTO of Confluency LLC, whose mission is to aid in the management of the infrastructure to distribute the world's most valuable resource, water. So with that, Sanjay, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Betsy. Nice to be here. Okay, I'm gonna try and share my screen. Is that coming up okay? Yep, cool, thanks. Okay, so really excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. And um, I hear you've had an amazing day of water design, understanding the treatment process, understanding the engineering design principles. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about my experiences with water today and relate them back to some of the things that you will have learned throughout the day. Um, my name is Sanjay. And I am a water engineer, and I will cover what um, some of the different disciplines in water engineering part of the way through. But essentially, the underlying physics, mathematics is all the foundation to an engineering engineering principles. And it's the decision making that goes on top of that that turns the underlying formulas and the um, foundation into engineering design principles. So it always requires a human to be able to make these decisions. And as you will have found from doing the design lab, that there are so many different ways that a treatment process or this design could, could play out, but it all comes down to coming to uh, thinking about the underlying business goal and how that relates to the outcome. Um, so one thing with water, <laughs> and this is what got me really interested when I first uh, fell into the role, and I'll explain how I got there as well, but when you turned on the tap this morning, water came out. When you flush the toilet, when you have a shower, the water just gets taken away, and it's really easy to take for granted how that water gets there or how that get water gets taken away. You imagine waking up in the morning, turning on the tap, and no water coming out. It changes the whole way that you think about uh, think about that engineering principles that go to get that water to your system. So I had the experience when I was um, growing up when um, my origins are from India and my parents took me back to, but I, uh, I was born in New Zealand. Um, my parents took me to India and back to the village where my grandparents grew up. They migrated to New Zealand in about the 1920s. And this was in, um, in, the, in about 2000, they took me there. And I was very um, unaware of how people are still living these days around the world 
And this village that they took me back to, which is where my grandparents grew up, still didn't have a constant supply of water. They had one tap that fed the entire village and water would only come out of that tap between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. each day. So each morning, we had some helpers that were there that were uh, making sure that we would survive in the village. But this is in the year 2000, so not that long ago. It might have been a while ago for some of you kids. You may not have been born. But um, when I was there, it was very eye-opening. And you turn up, wake up in the morning, some helpers go and get the water. They fill up buckets from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., store those for the rest of the day, and then have to apportion that water accordingly based on the day's usage. They have to make sure there's enough for the dinner preparation. They have to make sure there's enough to clean your hands, to have a, to have a shower, to drink and rehydrate. And you had to be very, very careful about its usage, spilling it. If you uh, There was no other way to get water back into the city unless you collected it and saved it up for the day. So you think about that in your daily life. What if you had to get up in the morning and collect the water for the day, store it, and then use it from barrels or buckets? We have the luxury of having turning, turning taps on and having that water getting taken away all through the underlying infrastructure. So that's one part of the water engineering principle, getting water to a city. But there are so many other aspects. And you think about that as, um, as you're designing things as well. Everything that comes through the engineering design principle is making life easier for today. And it's very easy to sort of forget about these underlying pipes that are unseen underground that are supplying the world's most precious resource. The other thing that I want to get across is that every city in the world that gets inhabited, the very, very first thing that's that has to be made sure is you have to have a decent water supply. It is the primary reason why places in the world get inhabited. If you don't have that primary water supply, you can't, you can't live there because you just don't have the basic necessity to live, more so than electricity, more so than even fire. So being able to hydrate, and um, that's what really gets me interested with water, that it's, one, it's the basic necessity. Okay, so these are the things I'm going to cover today, and um, hopefully uh, I've got passed through some of the questions that were um, provided up front, and I was very impressed, by the way, to have, <laughs> I wish I had had that um, understanding and um, experience when I was at high school, but to have those questions come through from high school students, um, I was yeah, very impressed. So I'll try and cover those as part of um, some of the slides that I'll be covering today, but happy to answer more of them later on, and I'm sure Betsy would have answered some of them um, earlier in the day as well. So I fell into water. And uh, what that means is that it wasn't uh, my core passion, but I, under, I really enjoyed and followed my passion with the subjects that I was doing at high school, um, maths, physics, chemistry, sciences. And that's what got me into the engineering discipline. And I studied at the University of Auckland. So what I want to get across here is that if you're following your passion, it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to know exactly what you want to do when you leave school, but keeping in mind that whatever you're doing, you need to enjoy it. And so I went into the engineering discipline, still not really knowing what an engineer was. And this is what got me really uh, involved with engineering tomorrow, that I wish I'd had people talking to me about what engineering was, and what engineers did prior to me even joining um, the engineering discipline. But I went through uh, the engineering program and did a discipline called engineering science. And that was really computer, uh, computer programming, optimization, looking at networks and flow of water or electricity or anything oil 
uh, anything that has sort of hydraulics or networks associated with them. Um, the engineering discipline is very versatile. It's taken me around the world. Um, like I mentioned, I grew up in New Zealand. Um, I lived in Belgium for a few years and was able to carry on my engineering um, discipline there. And also was living in the US for about eight years. I only moved back to New Zealand last year. But when I was uh, living in the US, I was in Philadelphia and in DC. But um, all to say that the skills that you learn can be uh, globally applied. While there are some nuances and intricacies in different regions of the world, different standards, different um, practices, the underlying principles are the same. And it's the um, using the foundational skills, so the maths and the physics, to understand trade-offs and the business, uh, the business goal that come into play with every sort of decision. And when you're designing these, um, the treatment processes or the, uh, the actual design for what you've done earlier today, it's understanding there are certain regions of the world that have lower access to um, money or don't have the, uh, the same sort of income as different parts of the world. So you have to design these in a way that is affordable to the people who are using it. You can go all out and build, put all of the material that you have into a filter, and it may clean the water um, even more so than the design that you came up with, but it comes at a bigger cost. So those trade-offs are more important in understanding, uh, understanding the impacts to the people who are using it than the actual design itself. And that's where that engineering, um, the engineering concepts come in. Okay, so I'm just gonna cover a few things about water and then get into a few of the projects that I've been working on. But you've probably seen this uh, version of this slide before, but water, the amount of water in the world at the moment is finite. It's not gonna go away. It's not going to get lost, but it takes different forms. And it's how it gets around the system that water engineers are really responsible for. The cost of getting it from um, a source to treatment to a consumer when you turn on the tap plays a big role. Even though it's going to keep going around the system, people are going to use it, it's going to go to a collection system, it's going to fall down in rain, go down storm waters, get back into the original um, forms. It still goes around the cycles and keep it making sure that it's in the right regions at the right times is really critical as well. For example, you could, you could draw it from an underground storage location, have it used, have that collection water pumped to a certain different part of the uh, a different part of the city, dumped back into a lake in a different area, and then slowly you're going to deplete the groundwater storage that you that you pulled it out from. Unless there's more rainfall that happens there, unless you start taking care of the resources that you pull it from, that's when things that's when you start to get into a bit of trouble. And one of the stories that I'm going to tell a little later is to do with the South Africa uh, Cape Town situation where they actually ran out of water and they were very, very close to this entire city not having any supply because of their overusage. But keep this in mind that it's finite, it moves around. We don't want to be moving it to places where it doesn't naturally come from because that changes the whole dynamics of the earth. At the same time, taking into account cost, obviously. So a water engineer is responsible for all of those processes. You get the water, uh, where the water originally comes from, the supply, goes to a treatment process. So you still have to have infrastructure that gets it from its original supply to the treatment process. The treatment process, which is what you were helping to design today and come up with new, uh, new ways of trying to clean that water. Once it gets treated, it gets then put into pipes, reservoirs around the city, 
And when you turn on your taps, it comes out. So it's that whole collection network. And this uh, little diagram on the right here is actually an entire city's underground network. It's the main pipes, not necessarily all the individual ones that go to households, but it follows the streets and you have simulation models of these. And that is what my primary focus is in my current role at the moment, which I'll get into. Collection, so once you start, once you use that water, it starts going down the drains, flush the toilet, it goes down, you have a shower, it goes down, you turn on the tap, it goes down, uh, down the sink, and that gets taken away. You also have rainwater that falls on the streets, and that also gets taken away. So you have uh, two, two concepts for collection, where you have wastewater, which is water that you use, and there's stormwater that comes in from the ground. And that all gets taken away, sometimes in separate systems, sometimes in combined systems, and then treated again, and then put back into the environment. <clears throat> so that's another part of it, the collection. Then you've got the flooding and the recycling. So understanding the flooding, that there are certain storms that come through, and uh, we've just had a huge one here in Auckland um, the last few days that we had 75% of the month's rainfall occur in one hour. And we've had houses that living areas go 30, uh, one foot, two foot underground. Some houses have been chest height in terms of the amount of water that have been in there. So huge amounts of damage. So you've got flooding that occurs there. And events like that are hard to design for because the city just doesn't have enough money to build the infrastructure to cater for these um, 100 year, 500 year storms, but it's all part of the engineering design. And then you've got the recycling that water can go back through um, the treatment plant and get treated, but you also have local recycling. That water that you have that goes down the shower is considered grey water, for example, as opposed to uh, wastewater. And that could be potentially used for flushing the toilet again. So there are all these little concepts that you can build around the system that take the pressure off the underlying infrastructure. And again, all part of the engineering design principles. Within each of these principles, you then get some very detailed understanding. And one of the questions that came through that I was intrigued with was how much time do you spend in front of a computer versus how much hands on? And my role predominantly is in front of the computer, but that's because I'm in so, uh, involved with the design process and the planning process before it gets to the actual physical construction of things. But there's a whole concept before that that goes into research and development that is very hands-on. There is a whole concept even after that that's very hands-on where you've got to be on site doing the construction. You've got to be touching the valves, the pipes, to make sure that the way that you've designed things or the way that you've chosen to piece things together comes uh, is actually constructed correctly. And then obviously at the very end, once it's all built, you've got the operations and maintenance and there's engineers associated with all of those parts along the system. So whether you choose to get into different uh, water engineering roles here, you can then choose in amongst those and however comfortable you are with hands-on, if you wanna be more hands-on, if you wanna be out in the field, there are all these roles that cater for those different, um, different preferences. So we've talked about cost a little bit here and that certain parts, uh, certain parts of the world have more money than others certain cities in different countries have more money than others, that you always need to be designing the, the water parts of the city based on the amount of money that the residents in that city have. You have more affluent areas of the world, like Dubai, the Middle East, that don't necessarily have natural supplies of clean water. They don't have that many lakes. They don't have many rivers running through. But so they have to predominantly get most of their water through desalination. And so desalination is where you convert this um, seawater or salt water, a very intensive process to remove that salt from it to turn it into fresh water. 
The cost of desalination has come down. It used to be about four or five times the price of conventional um, gravity fed treatment, but now it's down to about two. So it's still more expensive, but you think about the, and I'm not too sure if uh, many of you have the concept of understanding what the um, water bill comes, uh, comes to in your household, but if you were to double that, it has a big impact on everyone. Everyone uses water, everyone has a water bill, and you double that, and the household costs jump significantly, and it's an ongoing cost. So the cost of desalination plays a part as to whether it's, whether it's feasible to actually build in that city or not. Whether the technology is there, it's the decision of whether the um, residents in the city can actually afford it. Certain parts of the world have um, backup desalination plants, so they use conventional when, uh, when necessary, and what you are building is more of a conventional um, treatment process. But in places where they have droughts every five to 10 years, they might have a desalination plant that turns on at times when they, um, when they need it. So it lowers the cost, and those are all things that are thought out in advance in the designing. And then I also wanted to touch on aquifers. So in the first diagram, when it showed the uh, water that goes around the system, you have these underground storage locations, and these are aquifers, and they're not seen. You think about different parts of the world that are um, really appealing to live, and beach houses, for example, lake houses, areas on the beach, high-rise high -rise buildings that overlook the water. The reason why these are really highly sought after is because water is aesthetically pleasing. So many things go, um, it's, a, it's a nice lifestyle, boating, for example, swimming in the beach, but also just looking at it, you have water fountains around the city that usually serve not much more of a purpose than just they're nice to look at. Aquifers, on the other hand, are underground, they're not seen. And so there was a time when um, people were drawing from aquifers, it's pure water, and having them uh, using that as the water for the source of the city. But it comes at a cost as well. One, it's not seen, so it's very easy to draw upon and not, uh, not have residents of the city be aware of it. But if you draw too much, it actually uh, has an impact on the geological um, lay of the land and causes some really big issues when that starts to get depleted and it's not being returned um, in the same way. So there are lots of places around the world that are now running into this issue and a little too late. Um, it, it's all come at a, little, a little too late that they've started to observe those issues. But now it's becoming much more, um, there's a, a bigger awareness for it. Um, I wanted to also touch upon some of the projects that I've been involved with. And so my role, I worked as a, um, for a software company when I was in New Zealand. When I moved to the US, I worked for um, CH2M or Jacobs Engineering, which is an engineering consultancy. And now over the last few years, um, I started a company with a co-founder in Chicago. And we are mostly, we are involved with um, using simulation models, using the underlying pipe networks and models of the system to better operate and plan for capital improvements, all using the power of simulation, machine learning, optimization, and the compute power that's now available. So it's a little bit of programming, it usually comes down to the planning and the engineering design principles, no matter how much compute power you throw at something, it's all to, um, it's all to bring to the surface information that would help an engineer that's having to make decisions, come to those right decisions and justify those decisions. So it's always, um, and again, that whole trade-off uh, understanding 
What is it? What is the lowest cost? What are the impacts of the lowest cost solution? Does it actually treat the flooding or does it actually get rid of the water, uh, supply the water to the system at the right times at that cost? Is there a lower cost way of doing that? Can we afford a little bit more? Can we actually build the capacity a little higher and cater for these 100-year storms or 500-year storms? Usually the answer is no, but you need to make sure you're making these decisions with the most informed information. And having models of the system using machine learning, using the physics-based models of the system helps to address that, and that's what I'm doing at the moment. But one of the projects that we um, performed was um, looking at a wastewater treatment plant, and this example here shows the Blue Plains facility in DC, which is one of the biggest in the world. Knowing um, when you've got a treatment plant this size, there had to be a decision made by the people who were building it, companies that were building it, as to how big to make it. What are the trade offs? One, you're taking up a lot of land. You're taking up a lot of land on the edge of a river. You are taking up land that could be used for residential purposes, could be used for sports stadiums, could be used for everything else. So the bigger you make it, the more capacity it can take, so the more it can treat that water, but it comes at a cost. And there's obviously the cost to build it, let alone the, those trade-offs. The amount of water that comes into this treatment plant comes from wastewater and from stormwater. The number of residents in the city is usually known and can be planned for in advance. And so all of that water comes to this facility. You have storms that occur and all of that rainwater that falls onto the roads, falls into your gardens, goes down drains and also comes to this facility. That the water that comes to this facility is treated cleaned, not to the standard for drinking, but cleaned enough to put back into the environment and then discharged back into the river. Okay, so that's the process of how it goes through. You then now need to design this water treatment plant to cater for that water that's coming in. Again, the residents are known, so you've got the right amount of wastewater, but the storms that come through the DC area and any part of the country for that instance are variable. And when you've got really big storms, you've got an overflow, and the amount of water that's coming to this water treatment plant is more than the capacity. So what happens? You don't have the capacity to treat it, so you have to discharge it into the environment untreated, uncleaned. And that is one of the things that the US is really hammering down on now, that most uh, utilities that treat wastewater now have to uh, abide really stringent measures to make sure that they're not discharging clean uh, polluted water into these natural environments more than x times per year so for example one or two times per year you're allowed to do it but if you have more than that you're going to be paying fines and penalties so you have to make sure you design this system or design this treatment plant to cater for um, those regulations that are put in place globally. One of the things we looked at here was, what are the alternative measures of building this treatment plant? If you didn't have the capacity to expand further, what other measures could you take? And then you start thinking about, okay, for individual houses, water falls onto the roof, goes down the drains, and then makes it into the stormwater and makes its way to this water treatment plant, wastewater treatment plant. If you had green infrastructure, so green infrastructure is where um, it collects rainwater or stormwater and actually uses it for gardens or is absorbed into the soil a little bit more rather than just running off onto concrete. But it's got a lot of aesthetic, uh, aesthetically pleasing purposes as well as the benefit of taking pressure off the water that comes to this wastewater treatment plant different parts of the cities have different underground networks that collect that water and bring it to this wastewater treatment plant. So which the, the study that we did um, was to work out which parts of the city are most beneficial for the amount of rain that they get and reducing the amount of 
water that comes to the wastewater treatment plant, which means that you can downsize the wastewater treatment plant or at least not expand it. But it also means that you've got less water coming through and less chance of polluting the environment because all of that water sort of stays closer to the houses, is used for growing gardens and actually growing flowers, vegetables, the trees. So there's double benefits associated with that. And because of that underground network that collects all that water and brings it to this wastewater treatment plant, there's variability in the size of those around the city. There's variability in the amount of rainfall that different parts of the city get. There are going to be parts of the city that are going to be better to incentivize than others to build green infrastructure or put green roofs on their houses or put something in their backyard that actually helps collect the water and reuse it. So if the utility is then funding some of these projects, they can then direct that funding towards these houses that are going to have the most benefit. So it's a really, I don't know, to me, it's a really interesting problem. It takes into account hydraulics. It takes into account the cost of residents. It takes into account the incentives of the utilities that are um, having to make these decisions. Um, it brings together all the mathematics and foundational physics with the pipe networks that go underground, simulation models, optimization, bring machine learning into that. There's a, it's a lot more complex than it sounds, but um, it helps to really understand what's going on in the actual city itself. The um, One of my biggest um, passions, and this is where I've spent most of my engineering career, is in energy costs. The average, uh, the amount of water that you would use in a day is around about 100 gallons. One big barrel of oil, so the standard barrels that you see, that you see wine coming, that you can, that oil's coming when someone talks about a barrel, that's about 42 gallons, uh, 42 gallons of water. Two of those is the amount of water that you individually would use on average per day. You think about carrying that water from the source Let's say you've got a lake that's, I don't know, like five miles away is probably pretty close. But if you were to have to carry or roll that barrel of two barrels of those of that water from a lake that might have been five miles away, roll that or carry that back to your house and then use it, the amount of energy to get those barrels to your house is exactly what has to happen in an underground network. The treat you've got pipes that do it, which make it a lot easier. But that's, actually, that's essentially what happens. Someone is pumping water, or the utility is pumping water from its original source to get to your tap. And that requires the energy. You have some parts of the world where it's a lot easier to get to because that lake might be up on a hill. And then you can just let it roll down. You can let the barrels roll down the hill to your house. Similarly, you can let the pipe um, will bring water down to that house just for gravity. But most of the time, it has to be pumped across the city um, to get to those individual households. So the amount of energy that's actually used in the US to transport or just uh, collect water is around 3% of the entire nation's energy usage. That's, um, you think about that, and 3% may not sound like much, but just for treating, uh, just for transporting water around the system, it's in the trillions of dollars. The hydraulics associated with that is what I've mostly been focusing on. When to turn those pumps on to actually distribute that water at times when it's lowest cost. Can you fill reservoirs that are up on a high hill at lower times, at lower cost times of the day? So at night, for example, when the electricity cost might be cheaper, let that drain throughout the day. So that's from an operational perspective. How do you operate those pumps at lowest cost? And then you've got the amount of pressure in the pumps, uh, pressure in the pipes. If you're pumping a huge amount of water, the pressure in the pipes increases, which means you're pumping up against a lot more, um, a lot more head, which means it costs, uh, there's more energy required to push it along that pipe when there's lots of water running through it than when there's not. So that's just the basic understanding of the energy costs. But you think about that in real time, these water utilities are having to distribute this water and uh, maintain these costs. There are operators who sit in the 
in the control room who are turning on these pumps, opening up valves to make sure that water gets around the system. And they're just making sure the water gets there, making sure that the water is there when you turn on the tap. But there's energy costs associated with that as well. This also comes into play when you're designing the system from scratch. What sort of pumps should you use? Should I be designing reservoirs in areas where there are um, where there are hills that I can make use of gravity, for example? So energy costs is one of my um, passions, and that's that's what really gets me excited. It's a tricky, tricky problem. There's lots of dynamics that go into it. And then just want to touch on um, I wasn't in Cape Town at the time, but I did meet um, a colleague while I was in the US who was from Cape Town. But what happened back in 2018 is Cape Town had, they pretty much ran out of water. It's the first time um, in quite a while that a city has actually run out of water, especially a developed city like Cape Town. But they were six days away from the entire city not having any water to drink. And this, the picture above here is of people lining up in the days beforehand to get their allocation of water. This is back to, it goes back to what was happening um, in the village that I uh, visited when I was in India that I was originally from. You had people lining up for their water supply for the day. The issue here was that in Cape Town, if rain hadn't come in six days, they wouldn't have even had water available at times of the day to be able to collect this water. It would have been completely devastating. All the residents of the city, like, what can you do without water? You need it for drinking, you need it for living. Luckily, rain came through Cape Town and filled up their reservoirs, and now they're in a better state. But it got the entire world thinking about how to better manage this resource, how to make sure situations like this don't happen again, how to build in redundancy to make sure that you can get water supply from a different region into the area should something like that happen. Maybe a desalination plant, only in the case of situations like this, people would be willing to pay triple the price for water just to make sure they had it. So it's a, it's a big trade-off. Um, the guy that I met who came from Cape Town back in 2018 um, had mentioned that their whole way of living had changed. They were taking showers and collecting that water in a little um, tub hole in the shower once they had finished the shower, they'd collect that water and put it into a storage container used and use that for flushing the toilet. So their whole um, water usage appreciation uh, was brought to the surface. And now he said there are different, uh, they'll probably be implementing that for a while. One, because it's better for the environment, but two, they don't want this situation to happen again. So it's not until you experience or have to go through something like flooding, for example, that happened here, or Cape Town where they ran out of water, that you start to appreciate all that underground network and the supply and the engineering design principles that go into making a city work. With that, I wanted to round it off and um, I'll hand it back over to Monica, Constance and Betsy. Um, Thank you, Sanjay. I want to I want to say thank you to Sanjay for leading such a great uh, keynote speaker. I know that there was a lot of things that he mentioned. I'm wondering if there's any other questions that we have from the students live that want to type in chat or raise their hand and speak to Sanjay. They can do that now. This is your opportunity. I know that uh, he brought up a lot of things that I'm sure we, we were all interested in because I know you. I got to see some of your questions that your teachers uh, posted free uh, lab. Does anybody have any questions right now? Or does anybody from the ET team have any questions for Sanjay? And Sanjay, if you want, you can stop sharing your screen if you'd like. Okay, trying to find that button. <laughs> Let me see if I can do that for you. Hold on. Thank you. Sanjay, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. I see a lot of movement in some classrooms. Anybody have any questions for Sanjay? Oh. 
All right. Well, I want to say again, thank you to Sanjay and thank you to everybody for participating today. You all did an amazing job sharing your designs with us, sharing uh, your wonderful day and just want to throw in, oh, there's a question from Ursuline. Thank you, Ursuline. Ursuline said, what drew you to your job? And I just want to say, I remember your, your quote when you first started, you fell into water. So how did you fall into it, Sanjay? They want to hear about it. Yeah. Um, so like I said, I followed my passion while I went through university and uh, did the courses that I liked doing at high school. And when I, um, when I was applying for jobs, naturally fell into networking type roles. So networks, underground networks, whether it's water, whether it's transmission, they all applied. Uh, it brought together a lot of the physics and um, mathematics that I was enjoying. And um, the first role that I uh, went into was a software role that happened to be for water distribution systems. So it was an autopilot for um, operators who were control turning on pumps, opening up valves, and trying to lower their energy costs. And that's how I fell in love with water. Got to understand and appreciate how much work goes into these underground networks, these decisions that these operators were making on a daily basis. And from there, it sort of escalated and that's when I um, started to really understand everything that goes on in the city and how important those roles were, the operators' roles, the water utilities' roles, in making that city function. You take away the utility, and what can you do? One speaker that I um, listened to from who was a CEO of a water utility, he was asked how many jobs how many people he employs or how many jobs he supports. And his answer was, well, I have 2,000 employees working under me, but without my 2,000 employees, the entire 2 million population city wouldn't function. So really, I support 2 million, I support two million jobs um, in this city. So I thought that was quite a good uh, analogy. But that's how I fell into my role. Um, you really, when, once you get immersed in it all, you really appreciate everything that goes on from the water utility. Very nice. And we have a hand raised from Cardinal Hayes. Cardinal Hayes, you want to unmute? Oh, they just turned off their camera. Babe, can you unmute? Oh, hi. Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You're muted. Oh, no. We can hear you. No, no. Can... Oh, I have... can you? Okay. Um, I have a question for um, Mr. Patel. Uh, so, have you heard about the the uh, what is it? East is it East Palestine? East Palestine um, train derailment in Ohio. I have, have you not... heard about that? I have not. Sorry. Um. Okay. There was uh, recently like uh, a train derailment that was carrying a bunch of uh, very highly toxic chemicals in Ohio. And it actually spilled over um, a lot of the community there and it got into the water supply there, uh, I think a, a river. Um, and there's been a lot of sightings of like um, dead fish and a lot of uh, also possibilities of acid rain. Um, we're in New York. What, what is the possibility of something like that, of that magnitude actually affecting us here in the city? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good question. So um, water resource and supply is not my forte, but I'll try and answer um, uh, how that sort of impacts the downstream processes. Um, when you have a spillage like that, and you have oil spills um, that affect the um, water resources or the original source of the water, uh, like you said, a train derailment that may have affected things. That water there contaminates the uh, natural source that it uh, goes into. That water there, it takes a while for it to then recycle and clean itself. And so when you've got the treatment process, for example, that water, that source water still goes through a water treatment cleaning process. And there are some very stringent rules on that treatment process and making sure the water that comes out of that is uh, clean enough for drinking. And so they may have to change the treatment process a little bit. 
They may have to up the amount of chemicals that is used to actually clean the water after contamination spill. But after it leaves the treatment plant, there's a very high standard that it needs to be before it gets to your taps. So from a drinking perspective, uh, that's all handled by the water utility and by the underlying regulations. If you're talking about swimming in those areas or um, the biological um, disruption it has in those areas, that's when there's special uh, engineers that uh, focus on the contamination or the water resources. And you start to get, um, that's when the natural cleaning process plays a part. That you need to wait, then they might block off certain areas, they might make it unavailable for anyone to walk through because of that, but they have a good understanding. And now with simulation modeling, once you have a contamination leak like that, you can model it very quickly to understand the impacts that it has on those downstream processes. Like how much of that it, it spills in a certain area, does that affect the water supply in this area here? Because this is where we're drawing from. How much of an impact does it have? So you have all these modeling techniques now that can cater and help to rectify some of those issues that occur. Betsy, you may have uh, a little more to add there, but feel free to chime in. Um, so th that definitely isn't my specialty, but I do. I did hear that it was vinyl chloride um, that was the concern. I think five of the rail cars had it in it. Um, as I understood, originally the firefighters and first responders weren't even allowed to go in because of the fear of the toxic chemicals um, for them breathing it in and having trouble with their kidneys and um, causing cancers and stuff like that. Um, so when it happened, I believe they tried to burn off um, the chemical into the air to avoid letting it just sit uh, at the groundwater level. Um, but uh, I would have to uh, defer to Sanjay and some of those simulations in order to know how long and how what effect it could have in New York and when it would get there if possible. Great question. Thank you, Cardinal Hayes. And I see there's a question here from our ET team. <laughs> and it says, do you have a location in my in that you hope to move to or explore uh, their water resources that you have not been to yet? Is that for me? Yeah, that's for you. <laughs> yeah. I've um I've wanted to do some work in California. Like I know they have a lot of issues with just the water resources that are coming in, just trying to get that supply, not necessarily trying to lower energy costs, not trying to treat it. It's just having that water available to them. Um, I think there are some really cool projects that are going on there to help uh, mitigate some of those issues that they're having. All right. We have a question from a high school. They sent it to me directly. It's, what are some of the most important skills for a water engineer to have? <laughs> a good understanding of the business case. <laughs> um, while... It, a lot of computer power at the moment, simulation models can do the underlying physics, can do the underlying mathematics. But as an engineer, you need to know when to use that and why it's really important. And so I think that's the difference between a engineer and a mathematician or something like that. That once you uh, once you start applying some of those, the mathematics and the physics and behind it, um, you can then help to answer some of these real world problems. Great question. Thank you for, for that. I don't I don't know if they wanted me to shout them out. They didn't write, they didn't, they did they private message me, so I don't want to shout them out, but great question. Keep them coming. Any other questions for Mr. Patel? And I want to say thank you to all hollows for providing what uh, chemical that was filled in Ohio. Thanks for typing that in chat. I think that was Mr. Powers. So thank you, Mr. Powers. All right. I'm, I'm looking around at the screens. I don't see any other movement. So I'm going to say thank you to Mr. Sanjay Patel for leading such a great keynote today. We loved hearing about your experience and your and, and telling everybody, oh, I see all the thank yous coming into the chat. I'm going to ask my lovely ET team to please type in chat. And there it is. Thank you, Jen. Uh, remember to please complete your exit tickets. We want to hear how the, our day went and how your day went today. I'm actually going to share my screen to remind everybody that we have our next event coming up 
in March, our Space Day. So we would love to have all of you all back to participate in Space Day with us. And again, thank you for a wonderful day. Oh, I see the chat. Thank you, everybody is typing in chat.